one of the scariest moments of my life, formed a lifelong friendship. I watched a co-worker get stabbed through the bottom of his jaw, all the way up through his tongue. The knife only stopped when it hit the roof of his mouth. This was more than 20 years ago, summer of 1996. I was 18, a fresh high school graduate, and got my first job at a Hollywood video, which was a video rental store back in the 80s 90s, in my hometown. I'd only been working there a few weeks at the time of the incident, and it was my first time working the closing shift on a Friday night. We locked the doors at 12 and then my supervisor, who I'll call Kevin, 24, showed me how to shut everything down so we could go home. He was a nice enough dude, but I hadn't worked with him before, so I didn't know him personally at all. We left together at around 1 AM. The second he locked the door, some guy stormed around the corner of the building and started walking towards us. I wasn't sure if he was even planning on interacting with us, but Kevin immediately put himself between me and the guy. They started arguing, and Kevin told him he needed to go, or he'd call the cops again. He even called him by name, Daniel. It all happened so fast that I didn't have time to react. Daniel pulled out a switchblade, grabbed Kevin by the collar of his shirt, and stabbed him under the chin. I'll never forget the sound the knife made when it went through his skin, or the sound it made when Daniel yanked it back out. He let go of Kevin and just took off into the night. There was absolutely no way I could chase him down, especially knowing he had a weapon and clearly had no issues using it, so I knew the only thing I could do was call for help. Kevin had this shitty little Nokia phone that I used to call 911, and then I just stayed with him. He was really bleeding a lot and he couldn't talk, so I just held his hand while he laid on the pavement and cried. I used my car keys to rip off a chunk of my shirt to press against the wound to try and stop some of the bleeding until the ambulance arrived. It felt like we waited for hours, but he was loaded into the ambulance and on his way to the hospital before 1.15. The cops took my statement, but there wasn't much I could say since I wasn't even sure what had happened, and gave me a lift home. The next morning my boss called me and told me he'd gotten my closing shift that night covered and I should just rest for a couple days, as I already had that Sunday off. I went to see Kevin in the hospital that same day, and he still couldn't talk, but he did have a whiteboard so he could write stuff down. He told me Daniel was his ex, and Kevin had recently ended their four-year relationship and moved out of their shared apartment, which had made Daniel start acting scary. He would show up at Kevin's folks' house demanding to see him, he'd slashed the tires of Kevin's car twice and had started leaving threatening messages on his answering machine and in his mailbox. Kevin had told the cops each time these things happened, but this was 1996 is ruralish Ohio, and they weren't taking him seriously because he was gay. Two days before Daniel came to our work, Kevin's father had found a dead rat on their front doorstep and the police had simply written it off again, stating that a cat had probably left it there. The force of the blow had fractured his mandible and palate as well as knocked out a few teeth. He had to have his jaw wired shut for a while, but even though he couldn't speak he wouldn't stop thanking me. He must have written it 100 times in the hour or two I sat with him that day. I could tell he was really scared still, so I promised him I'd come back the next day to visit again and went straight to the cops to tell them everything I could about Daniel from what Kevin had told me, including his full name and address. They arrested him later that day, and he still had the bloody knife in his front pocket when they caught him. He was eventually charged with assault with a deadly weapon and sentenced to five years in prison, because he had a few other petty charges on his record at the time. I visited Kevin in the hospital every day while he was there, and continued going to see him even after he was released into the care of his parents. They continued to thank me endlessly for staying with their son after it happened, and his mom used to give me plates of food and desserts every time I went over there. I went back to work that Wednesday. And Kevin did eventually come back too, but only after his jaw was healed. Six years later, he was the best man at my wedding, and four years after that he made me and my wife the godparents of his first child, whom he'd adopted with his long-term partner, Michael. Daniel was in and out of prison for the next 15 years for other minor offenses, before he died in a drunk driving accident in 2012. Kevin is still in my life today, 
and has been my closest friend for more than two decades at this point. A few times a year, he still thanks me for staying with him that night and not just letting him bleed out on the pavement and I always tell him the same thing, I'd do it again in a heartbeat. I was just a kid and I was really scared but I knew he needed my help and I just did what I hoped someone else would do for me in the same situation. Don't forget to click subscribe if you want more weekly updates. Thank you.